The United States Custom House and Post Office is an architectural masterpiece, a stunning example of 19th century construction and craftsmanship. Built as a symbol of the federal government's power to the growing West, it was a testament to the significance of St. Louis for a growing country. How this magnificent structure came to be and what it represents are intimately linked to how the nation toiled to regain its unity after the Civil War and how St. Louis worked to reestablish its sense of pride in the midst of continual change. The building's 122-year history is a story of politics, civic progress, and financial innovation, of preserving the past while working toward the future, of making what was once a withering symbol of urban decline an icon of civic pride and renewal. Completed in 1884, it was as much a catalyst for change then as it is today. On March 15, 2006, the United States Custom House and Post Office in St. Louis was rededicated following an unprecedented six-year, $48 million redevelopment that brought the building into the 21st century. The complete renovation of this National Historic Landmark has transformed the old post office, as it's affectionately known, into a vibrant hub of activity and the home of an impressive mix of businesses, educational institutions, and government organizations. This unique combination of business people, students, judges, restaurant patrons, and library visitors has brought new life to a once distressed business district. The 2006 grand opening heralded the rebirth of a vital centerpiece in downtown St. Louis. Our downtowns across the country face great challenges. Uh, St. Louis is no different. Since World War II, the city had been in steady decline. As rents dropped and tenants moved out, the economic cycle that kept building owners maintaining and reinvesting in properties became strained. What we have seen happen in American cities, largely as a result of white flight and, and suburban development uh, patterns through 50 years of American history, is dis serious and deep disinvestment in our core cities that broke that cycle. The character of St. Louis is represented in those buildings, and yet for many, many reasons, economic, demographic, uh, even technological, uh, those buildings have gone into disrepair. It was basically a collection of, of pigeon roosts. I mean, it was really terrible. Uh, the, the old post office itself is no longer in use. The surrounding buildings, Paul Brown, Arcade, Century Building, Syndicate Trust, all of that were, uh, were decrepit and abandoned. We had one gentleman who was here to do a study of St. Louis on neighborhoods. Well, he just happened to drive through the old post office district on his way to the Post-Dispatch editorial and made a comment that our downtown St. Louis is, is dead. Uh, there were about two million square feet of empty and underutilized buildings and warehouse space in the immediate area of the old post office. It was clear that downtown St. Louis was not in good shape. The old post office, I believe, for St. Louis was uh, a symbol of where St. Louis was going, what its future prospects were. It had been uh, a landmark in downtown for a long time, uh, so its demise was seen as symbolic of St. Louis's decline. You could walk right by this building and never see it, even as huge as it is. Because of everything that was torn down and falling down and barricaded around it, uh, you were watching where you stepped and who was walking beside you instead of looking at those buildings. In 1998, Downtown Now, a civic leadership group led by Tom Reeves, published its comprehensive study for revitalizing St. Louis. The Downtown Action Plan noted that a top priority for the community should be redevelopment of the old post office and surrounding buildings. Obviously, something had to be done. Obviously, if we were going to turn things around in downtown St. Louis, this area had to be first. 
So the first step was looking at the various buildings in the nine block area and, and finding a centerpiece from which to raise capital, uh, engender a sense of energy, and catalyze um, additional development. The old post office was ready for rehab. It was in a key location in downtown St. Louis. And it was a spectacular building. And to have a building like that sit in our urban core and not be utilized was a shame. But St. Louis is a city accustomed to change, reinventing itself, and finding new uses for its historic buildings. St. Louis Union Station, once the busiest rail hub in the United States, is now a hotel and a convention and shopping center. And other St. Louis landmarks like Louis Sullivan's Wainwright Building, the Couple Station Warehouses, the turn of the century buildings on Washington Avenue, and even the old rail lines have all been transformed to meet the needs of today's society. But back in 1764, St. Louis was just a small French fur trading outpost. It quickly became an important center for traffic along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. And by 1804, Lewis and Clark were setting off on their great exploration from its shores. Later, news of the 1849 California gold rush brought thousands through the city as westward expansion exploded and the city prospered. But change was soon to come. At the federal courthouse in St. Louis, the slave Dred Scott sued for his freedom. The case highlighted the slavery issue that would eventually divide the nation and begin the Civil War. When the war ended, the federal government faced the great challenge of ensuring the country's financial and social stability in the aftermath of such a devastating conflict. The federal government wanted to show its own power and supremacy over the state governments of the period. So anything the federal government did, they wanted it to be big, bold, and to show some sort of permanence and authority. To project this power, five grand custom houses to be built in the nation's centers of commerce and transportation were commissioned by Congress in 1865. St. Louis was then the nation's largest city west of the Mississippi River and was therefore a prime central location for the distribution of mail, gold, and justice. The U.S. Custom House and Post Office would house all the federal offices in St. Louis, including one of only three sub-treasuries in the country. Design of the building began in 1866. Alfred B. Mullet, the supervising architect of the Treasury Department, chose the very imposing Second Empire architectural style for the building's facade. Second Empire style is a very three-dimensional style. Uh, it's designed to be seen from all different directions and typically is the center point of a uh, building square block area in an urban area. The old executive office building in Washington, D.C., also designed by Alfred B. Mullet, and the Louvre Museum in Paris are perhaps the most notable examples still standing. The strong symmetry of the design the rhythmic use of paired columns, ornate capitals, architectural details around the windows and dormers, and the double-hipped mansard roof all work to create a structure that appears imposing, permanent, and monumental. Plans for the new building were still being drawn when the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 demonstrated the vulnerability of America's cities. Hundreds died, and thousands of buildings were destroyed during the two-day blaze. With the threat of fire still a primary concern for Alfred Mullet and the design team in 1872, an innovative concept and design was created to protect the windows from fire that could enter the building from the outside. And the design consisted of these cast iron shutters. This is a patented system that was created just for the post office project. To further add to its security, a 29-foot air moat surrounds the building. 
limiting access, and providing light to the basement floors. One of the experimental yet untested ideas was that uh, mail could be delivered directly into the building by virtue of the fact that the Eads Bridge, which was constructed in 1874, would be able to provide a rail link that passed directly adjacent to the building via this tunnel, as you can see right here. You know, they were shipping gold, they were shipping, uh, you know, arms, I mean, all kinds of things that were being shipped from place to place. And even in terms of the federal government moving things around, well, this would be a place that would be definitely secure right in the, the heart, very heart of the city. Unfortunately, the system did not work quite as anticipated as the first train arrived with its coal-fired engines billowing smoke, the entire building filled with smoke so that the efficiencies of being able to deliver the mail directly to the post office did not work. The only remnant of that period of 1884 is the soot that exists on the building to this day. The old post office, once a symbol of a strong united government in the late 19th century, was by the close of the 20th century an unused relic sitting at the heart of a vacant downtown St. Louis. The nation's other grand custom houses had all been demolished. By 1997, the future of the old post office in St. Louis was uncertain. To be quite frank, it was not really a priority for the federal government. It had been designated an historic landmark uh, many years previously. Uh, but uh, there were lots of other things that were very important for the federal government to do. Well, I think the, the biggest threat to the building it was just the thought that the Wreckers Ball was going to overtake it. And there were several times when the, when the federal government had the building that they were talking about selling it and, and maybe just, you know, getting rid of it uh, altogether. Essentially, we had a shuttered building that was closed to the public because we didn't wish it to degrade any further. We couldn't cash flow it. We couldn't manage it well enough to cash flow it. And so we had to make a decision. Do we leave it boarded up as an edifice to our inability to manage it or to invest money? Or do we put it in the hands of, of people with a vision and the financing and the, and the flexibility to bring that building back to life and contributing to the vibrant fabric of downtown St. Louis. In the early beginning, the only flicker of life in the old post office district was Webster University's interest in the post office. Well, we heard a rumor that the old post office might be available from the GSA, and we started to investigate whether or not it was, uh, because we thought that it would be a perfect location to expand from our current location in the Lambert building into the old post office. So our first job was to work with Webster to see if this could possibly be accomplished. Even after there was talk of it changing hands, it, it really mattered who took ownership of the building, because it had to be someone who could maintain a huge structure like this and, and keep the integrity of the structure. Well, when you have a 230,000 square foot uh, building of an 1884 vintage, it's not everybody that can take ownership of that. Oh, did I mention that there are historic covenants attached to the building? Oh, did I mention you're going to have to invest a great deal of money into preserving those parts of the building that have architectural significance? This was not an easy building uh, to either uh, maintain or restore or convey. Our role was to work with Webster uh, in a uh, practical and a financial sense to see if we could come up with a structure um, for the university to actually occupy the post office. The questions were whether they should own it and do the development themselves or become a major tenant in someone else's development. So the concern that we had was could we in fact pull off the developer's role, the educator's role, the, the fundraising, uh, all of this to, to be able to utilize this historic building. I remember going to Washington DC and talking with the GSA and they said, well, we've got to give the building to the Department of Education. And the Department of Education says, well, we don't know if we want to give it to you. We have to do this, this, and this, and this. 
I came back from that, that trip just so depressed because I, there were huge obstacles. If it were easy, we would have done it a long time ago. If it didn't take a lot of investment, the federal government probably would have done it. We saw the vision. We had that vision in our head. We've got to find a way to overcome those obstacles. We asked people in the community who were the experts in developing a very complicated type project. And we were told that basically there were two, Steve Stogel and Mark Schnook. The development team that would pull this project together consisted of a joint venture between the Desco Group, led by Mark Schnook, and DFC Group, led by Stephen Stogel. DFC's extensive experience is primarily in complicated and difficult financial arrangements, with over 87 urban, residential, and historic developments. Desco is a St. Louis-based commercial real estate developer with over 12 million square feet of retail and office space in various states. I mean, the word is that if you have a very complex, very complicated development project that's going to take some creative financing techniques, um, Steve Stogel and DFC are the ones you want to call for that. Webster agreed not to be the developer but to be a tenant and wanted me to find a co-development partner who had commercial experience. Even before Webster had contacted Stephen, and it may have been Al Kurth uh, representing uh, Webster at the time, I'd been down to the district uh, uh, with Tom Reeves and toured the area in April of 2000, I believe, and really wanted to try and get involved. Our family wanted to get involved in trying to help execute the Downtown Now plan. And Tom took me on a tour, and through that tour, we looked at lofts, we looked at another, a number of different opportunities, but it was the old post office that stood out that, uh, in my mind, that had to be done successfully in order for the whole district to succeed. And within a couple of weeks, Mark and I met and took us less than 30 minutes to agree to give it a try. I think the common goal was we both recognized that the old post office was the jewel and it was the anchor of the district. And in order for the downtown now plan or the, uh, the old central business district of, of St. Louis to experience redevelopment, the old post office had to be done uh, successfully and first. He had never done deep urban projects. I had never done a commercial project this size. So we needed each other's strengths. And it's been a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder partnership the whole time. We had vaguely uh, known each other and talked about it, uh, some other opportunities in the past, but we'd never worked together before. And I think there was a deep respect for each other and each other's strengths. Stephen uh, having the ability to uh, finance historic projects. You know, we're owners of buildings. We've built and developed and leased and managed buildings for, for many years and continue to do so. And that's what we brought to the table. We had the infrastructure to build and lease and manage. Stephen had the infrastructure to create the financing, uh, the difficult uh, financing structure to, to make this project work. The promise we made was that St. Louis had, in 2000 and 2001, a shabby living room. And if people would trust us, we would make that living room elegant. On March 15th, 1884, General William Tecumseh Sherman, one of the great Civil War heroes, presided over the opening dedication ceremony and proclaimed to the crowd of 5,000 that this edifice was as grand, if not the grandest, of all the public buildings in the United States outside the city of Washington, D.C. It was indeed a majestic building occupying an entire city block with a cupola rising nine stories above the unpaved streets. At a cost of $6 million, it was the most expensive building in St. Louis. It loomed over its neighbors on the western edge of the downtown area, and in a sense, much of the territories of the western United States. In this effort to reassert the primacy of the federal government um, west of the Mississippi, um, that it contained not only the federal district courts, but the federal court of appeals that encompassed at that time 11 states and three territories and extended as far west as the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, but also included the United States Attorney's Office, 
the post office for this region and a number of other very important and significant federal offices. That was the federal government, the embodiment of the federal government west of the Mississippi. At the time of its dedication, many questioned the building's location so far from the river and the center of downtown. That sentiment, however, quickly faded as development sprung up around the U.S. Custom House. None of the numerous buildings that today overshadow the building existed in 1884. Spurred on by the traffic and the importance of the federal offices, the city soon began clearing the surrounding blocks and constructing the skyscrapers we see today. By the close of World War I, the U.S. Custom House and Post Office sat at the bustling center of downtown. Streetcars ran down olive between the canyons of buildings. Its neighboring structures held the headquarters of two railroads, several hotels, multiple theaters, shopping arcades, banks, and offices of all types. 100% Corner, as the intersection of Olive and 9th Street was known, was the place to see parades, conduct business, and watch the energy of the city. The Federal Circuit Court's breakup of the Standard Oil monopoly and the trial surrounding the Teapot Dome oil field scandal of the 1920s were decided in courtrooms at the U.S. Custom House. The gangsters were so violent back in the 20s that when they tried the Egan Gang, uh, the federal district judge actually had the metal fire curtains closed so that um, the witnesses, etc., we would say, wouldn't suffer a, a fatal case of lead poisoning from one of the high-rise buildings located across the street while they were testifying. Uh, that actually happened in that trial. So a lot of important history in those courtrooms that, that we should honor and preserve. In 1935, after 50 years in the U.S. Custom House, the U.S. courts vacated the building and moved to the new federal building at 12th and Market Streets. Soon the Postal Service followed suit, moving to the new post office, a larger facility closer to Union Station where the mail trains operated. Over the next 20 years, the remaining federal offices were relocated away. And in 1961, with the completion of the new federal office building adjacent to the new post office on Market Street, the future of the old post office, as it had come to be known by then, was uncertain. The 1960s marked an era of large construction projects in St. Louis. The Arch, and Bush Stadium were the new pride of the city, stunning examples of modern architecture and civic progress. The old post office was an obsolete relic of a bygone era, and it was announced that the building was to be declared surplus government property and disposed of by the mid-1960s. Developers and the government eyed the block the old post office occupied as a prime spot for new construction. In 1964, city officials endorsed a plan to erect a sleek 30-story office building with underground parking for 900 cars. Crews drilled through the sidewalk to test the soil for the new building's foundations. Then, public outcry surfaced. Many groups fought against the demolition, citing the building's historical significance. This building is one of the last remaining examples of the Second Empire style. And as the last remaining example of a building of that type, this makes the St. Louis Old Post Office even more significant and important as a historic landmark. Don't let the post office go down, down, down. We need her and she's sound. Through the tireless efforts of Austin Leland and others, the building was declared a National Historic Landmark and demolition was avoided. The other buildings around the old post office, however, met a different fate. The Victoria was taken down in 1974 and became a surface parking lot. The Columbia, in an unusual cost-saving measure, was reduced from nine stories to two. The arcade, 
Paul Brown, and Century Buildings had few tenants. When the Postal Branch moved out in 1975, the General Services Administration recognized that something needed to be done with the almost vacant building. Several architectural firms were invited to submit proposals for adaptive reuse, both as new federal offices and commercial space. The GSA took the best from each plan, and five years later, a $16 million renovation was underway. The exterior was repaired and cleaned. Up-to-date electrical, heating, and air conditioning systems were installed. In the atrium, escalators and a grand staircase were added to access the lowest levels where a food court was constructed to serve the building's new occupants. The old post office reopened in 1982 and was heralded as the beginning of St. Louis's reurbanization. But the success of the renovation was short-lived. As the uh, food court failed, as the uh, uh, use of the building by the agencies it was housing fell out of, um, out of functional optimism for them. Then I think it went right back into that uh, movement from kind of a class A office space to class B office space uh, and became, uh, from a market perception, somewhat obsolete again. They took the building and, and carved it into office space and did uh, some ground floor uh, restaurants and retail without tying it to the rest of the community or tying it to the rest of downtown. It was just literally a done building. And so it sat underutilized through most of the 1990s. The GSA continued to preserve the structure, replacing the deteriorating Daniel Chester French sculpture, Peace and Vigilance, with a replica atop the dome. The original sculpture was brought inside and prominently displayed in the central atrium. Even with steady GSA maintenance, a viable reuse for the old post office did not emerge. There was a real negative stigma about the 1975 effort to revitalize the post office. People were very fond of saying, oh look, we can't possibly do new office in downtown St. Louis, particularly renovate office space in downtown St. Louis. Look at the old post office. It's been sitting there vacant for a very long time. It was sitting there as a great, wonderful, beautiful old white elephant. Uh, we knew that something needed to be done, and in the past we had explored several other opportunities. Uh, but uh, without going into the long list of uh, why none of them would work, let me just say that none of them would work. You know, this was a courthouse. It's called the old, the custom house, it's the old post office, all of those things are right, but when it was built, it was for the Federal Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals and for the Federal District Courtroom, and if it hadn't been for those things being in here at the time it was built, they never would have built this kind of a building just to house the post office. Early on, before tenants were identified, we were trying to look at alternative uses for spaces that just did not lend themselves to other uses, and the courtroom with its extremely tall ceilings, its great volume of space, all of which is extremely historic, simply would not have allowed the kind of renovation without sacrificing some of the historic character. We weren't quite sure what we were going to do with the courtrooms. They, we had these two massive courtrooms and there were all sorts of uh, restrictions, historical covenants, that we couldn't subdivide the space, put up demising walls, and lease it out for leasable space. So we were wondering what we were going to do with them. Could we do wedding receptions, parties, but how do you count on that kind of income stream? Then in July of 2001, Mayor Francis Slay called, the, called us, the Desco DFC team. He said, on Monday, the Court of Appeals would like to the Eastern District would like to see the building and perhaps be your tenant. I said, we can be ready. And the first time we got in this building, we did not have access to many of the rooms, so we were just seeing the grand uh, hallways and staircases. We did not see the courtroom at that time. But even then, this building was on our wish list as a possible destination for the Court of Appeals. It wasn't until uh, until after that, when we first saw the courtroom, that we realized what a spectacular space this was and what a great fit our court would be for the space here. 
So in two weeks time, Trivers Associates worked on a space plan and all 14 judges with their chambers and their administrative offices, they fit into the upper two floors of the building like a glove. We're not talking about creative re reuse here. We're talking about the use that the Americans that built this building, the use that they originally intended for it, that the, this Court of Appeals could actually uh, make the building live as it was originally intended. The best use for old courtrooms is, guess what, courtrooms. Uh, the best room, best occupancy for judicial space is judicial agencies. But what do you do with subterranean space and sub-subterranean space that has no windows? Uh, a university, which is teaching classes primarily at night, uh, can make good use of those spaces. It's very difficult to get Class A office tenants to go downstairs. So with Webster University, they committed to take the first level below grade for their classrooms. And we were very excited about that because with the open atrium, the students walk in the building, they walk past the Peace and Vigilance statue, down this grand staircase in the atrium to their classrooms. And it was just a perfect fit. We saw it as an extraordinary opportunity for a building that had had uh, two failed attempts at preservation. You didn't just have any tenant stepping forward to, to occupy this building. You had, you had tenants who were perfect for this building. I mean, because they're institutions that essentially go on forever, they're going to outlast this building. We saw these as extraordinary opportunities that uh, we felt needed to be capitalized on while they were available, because finding agencies with the interest and the fit uh, can be an extremely difficult uh, problem. We face it every day on buildings all across the nation. This is the time we thought it had the best chance for success and we wanted to be a player. I mean, uh, you just don't want to be a spectator in this. We want to be a player. The almost seven decades old question of what to do with the old post office had finally been solved. The biggest challenges for the redevelopment, however, lay ahead. We sat down with our prime tenants, Webster University and the Court of Appeals, and they each inked letters saying, unless the parking was contiguous and ample, they wouldn't proceed with the deal. Like it or not, St. Louisans are wedded to their cars. If you don't have available parking for them, they will go someplace else. The Court of Appeals needed contiguous space nearby space, partly for security reasons. We have a lot of young clerks uh, that are working here late in the evening hours and the rest, and we uh, wanted space that was nearby and secure, and we have to be mindful of judicial security these days. It's easy for us or anyone to say that's not an important criteria, but to those folks, it is. And when their involvement, their participation in the project is hinged on the issue of parking, and parking becomes the key issue. Downtown office tenants, first choice, park in the building. We knew that wasn't possible at the old post office, so we needed to find spaces for the old post office tenants, and we needed uh, over 400 spaces. And the reality is, if you're gonna bring in retail businesses or other types of tenants, you need parking in a, in a very close proximity. We know from experience that in the housing market, people expect parking to be theirs, designated, available. When you buy a unit and you have a parking place, you don't want a hunting permit. You want a parking place. So we inventoried the uh, various parking facilities that were in the area, including we knew the convention center garage was coming online as well as 7th and Pine was being planned. And including those two structures, there were fewer than 100 spaces available on a monthly lease basis. That, was, that wouldn't meet the needs of the old post office, nor would it meet the meet needs of the surrounding buildings. The parking study concluded that a new parking structure would need to be located in Post Office Square. An obvious choice was to build a garage on the existing surface lot to the north. That lot is designed for, by the Downtown Action Plan, it's planned for a public park. And the idea was to bring people visiting the convention center to come into Old Post Office Square and to make it a real vibrant people place. And with a parking structure there, that just wouldn't have happened. And the lot's narrow shape could only accommodate an irregular parking structure. Another solution was to convert the condemned Century Building to a parking garage. 
The real issue at the Century was that the efforts to keep that building in a viable market did not provide sufficient income to do substantial maintenance and care of the building over the years. Its interior deteriorated to next to nothing. It developed structural problems through the protracted fights with various owners in its later years who allowed water to enter and, and rust to set into major structural elements and, and uh, uh, its deterioration would have made uh, renovation of that building an, an increasingly expensive operation. We spent a lot of time studying the, the Century Building and trying to figure out if we could park within the four walls and make it work. And there were issues with obviously structural, there were issues with a number of parking spots that you could create. You would lose all of the uh, historic nature of the building in order to access ingress and egress to the facility. And, and uh, we didn't want to knock that building down, but it, it just wouldn't work. It was a very tough situation with the Century Building when the, the choice was, do you want 20 more years of vacant space and a dead district that continued to decline and maybe even jeopardize losing the old post office? Or do we make the hard choice and remove the Century Building as one piece of the equation as part of a process that saved the whole district? Well, it's easy to say that. Uh, there was much debate. There was, uh, you know, relatively smaller groups and individuals who were opposed to this. And their argument was, uh, why are you supporting this project when, based on the parking need, when the projects are pr proceeding without the parking need? And I told them, you're, you're going to disagree with me on this one, but in three, four, five years from now, you are going to see a district that you can be proud of, that all of us can be proud of, that all of St. Louis can be proud of. And that's how we left it. Uh, they continued their fight, and I respect them for their decision and their opinions on the issue. So we went sort of back around the process again and had to talk to everybody and basically called all those developers and owners of those buildings and said, so why are you proceeding? And we found in some cases they didn't have their full funding in place. They could do two floors, but they couldn't do seven floors until they had a parking commitment for the rest of the level because bankers know too that you got to have parking. I would say without the old post office building, clearly the Roberts brothers, our companies, our investments into the Mayfair Hotel, into the Roberts Orpheum Theater, or even into the Board of Education building would have either been delayed or in one or two cases may not have occurred. When we purchased those buildings, the Syndicate and the Century, both of them were under a court order to be demolished. So basically what we did, we bought both buildings, saved one of them, and took the other one down so that the, that the syndicate trust, the old post office, and the other several buildings in the immediate area that were vacant uh, could be viable for redevelopment opportunities. The parking structure known as the 9th Street Garage would provide the necessary parking to accommodate the old post office tenants, as well as the future users of the surrounding buildings. The 1,050 space garage would be developed by DFC and DESCO, but owned and operated by the state of Missouri through the Missouri Development Finance Board. With the total project costs estimated at $81 million, including the $33 million 9th Street garage and the $48 million old post office renovation, getting the project financed was not going to be easy. The old post office was listed by the GSA among the top six architecturally significant historic structures in its entire 2200 building inventory. But before the project could proceed, the GSA would have to transfer ownership of this national historic landmark to the state of Missouri, an unprecedented process. Ultimately, uh, the federal government disposed of the property to the state. The state leased back to the uh, developer and the developers operating the facility. Now that sounds pretty simple and basic on its face, but with each of those steps there were challenges and hurdles to overcome. With each of those steps there was financing to be arranged and investors uh, to talk to, as well as insurers and bondsmen. So it was uh, an enormously complex deal. Everybody was walking into unchartered territory. Nobody tried to put something like this together uh, in the history of this country uh, and make it work. The, the technical issues were, were almost overwhelming. Um, the ownership, getting the building um, from a government structure into private hands so that you could take advantage of the tax credits that were available. Um, just the sheer 
uh, leasing, G getting tenants to believe that this was actually going to happen. I mean, that took just a monumental effort. It was always an uphill push to get this deal to closing. There have been a, a lot of historic renovations of older buildings in the city of St. Louis. This is by far the most complicated, the most difficult from a political and a financial standpoint to get done. Logistically and everything you can think of, this, is, this was the most difficult project. You're dealing with a federal government that's never done this before, and you're dealing with a state government that's never done it before, and you're dealing with a city government that candidly is trying to survive, and you're trying to put all of these dynamics together and make it work. Fortunately, um, there were people who were, who were very adept at this. Steve Stogel, who was really the, the brains behind the financing operation, conceived of, of how this could be done. To view this as a normal economic deal isn't the correct dialogue at any point at all. This is a transaction where people paid market rent or less to be in space that no private developer could ever afford to build out because it was just too expensive. It's the beauty of the building which really creates the, the issues in, in redevelopment. You've got such a huge, massive, historic building that has you know, tremendous volume on the interior of which you know, your total square footage is uh, 240,000 and, and change that you have got to apply redevelopment costs to, but in fact, there's only about 140,000 square feet and change that you receive income on. So that gap between your 240 and your 140, uh, you're paying for redevelopment, but you're not receiving any money in cash flow and in your rent stream for that. Hence, you needed the whole range of subsidy from state tax credits, federal tax credits, the contributions from the corporate community, the grant Senator Bond got to do the public improvements around the post office to the tax increment financing added by the city. We invested uh, $6.6 .6 in tax increment financing, and those TIP dollars, along with other uh, financings, helped bring the uh, historic uh, old post office building to its completion. Much of the $81 million project was financed through the use of equity partners. U.S. Bank's Community Development Corporation contributed over $25 million through the National Trust's Community Investment Corporation. Bank of America funded more than $12 million through the Enterprise Social Investment Corporation. An additional $28 million for the old post office and 9th Street Garage projects was contributed to the redevelopment through corporate donations from the St. Louis business community. That's a skillful development team, no doubt, that can go out and raise private contributions uh, to make a real estate deal happen. But what that really represents is uh, the community's commitment as, uh, uh, as the leadership of the community uh, to the importance of that building, to the use of historic preservation as a revitalization strategy, and to the neighborhood uh, that could be revitalized around the old post office. This is what needs to happen in downtown St. Louis. This is the catalyst that can really spur other development. And we have over 5,000 employees downtown, so it's important to us to make sure that the downtown is vibrant, that it's usable, and that it's a place where people actually want to come. So we looked at this long and hard and thought that a $10 million investment by our company would be a sound investment and one that would lead to even greater development and even greater rewards than that. Nine corporations and the Danforth Foundation, the Danforth Foundation going first, put $28 million into the financing puzzle so that the post office could be done right and the infrastructure facility known as the Ninth Street Garage could be done not just for the post office but for Post Office Square and we had the money to do it right. It was uh, a layer cake, if you will, of, of um, financing that if you were to look at the ownership chart and the flow of funds, it'd be, you'd be confused. This is not for the faint of heart. It is for truly um, uh, complex financing that uh, I think is to the great credit of the development team that, that um, brought this project off. 
as we were going through the project, uh, the new market tax credit initiative became available, which was brand new. And uh, nobody on the team had ever worked through that, but uh, we, were, we were able to, obviously, Stephen figured it out pretty quick, but what an education it's been for myself and our organization uh, on how these types of projects work. Taking four years to get to closing may be a new world record. It is, and that, but that goes to the level of difficulty of this particular project. You know, four years and probably, you know, 300 financial iterations later, we just kept working. We started with, you know, let's try it this way. And you'd start down the, the path in terms of how to structure the financing with what you knew at that time. And then literally, because it took so long for all the various pieces to come together and you'd think you'd be done and then all of a sudden a new program would come out and your first thought is, oh, do we go back and redo it? No, let's keep going. Well, let's look at the new program and the new program meant a significant amount of subsidy and in a building like that that's very expensive to rehab, that subsidy is important. So you literally go back and start all over. Most of the things that we get involved in would be in months or maybe a couple of years in, in the establishment of an overseas campus that might take a, a couple of years. Establishing a China campus took one year to get through the Chinese government, all of the red tape, uh, et cetera, that you would have. That was a one-year project. We're talking eight years for a project in downtown St. Louis, but it was worth it. The old post office, the pre rehab old post office was not that bad. I mean, we've seen buildings a lot worse to start with than the old post office because the government had maintained it. It just wasn't usable and nobody was occupying it. It wasn't really occupiable in its current form. One of the real architectural challenges was to take this 1884 building and to modernize it and bring it into the 21st century. And I'm not just talking about mechanical systems, heating and cooling, although that was very important, but to make it a very desirable place for tenants in the building. This building is now 122 years old and it will be there in 100 years. And the renovation work we did today will last that long because we were allowed to completely rebuild all the systems, the roof, the electrical, the mechanical, the plumbing. But we started with a building the federal government took really good care of. It would require a real feat of cooperation. The building needed to be renovated in accordance with the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation, the National Park Service, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Historic Buildings Office of the GSA, the State Historic Preservation Office, and the Missouri Development Finance Board would all oversee the architectural aspects of this renovation. So what we did initially is we had numerous design charrettes and we got everybody into a room and said, what if we do this? Is that okay with you? And, and we worked through the various constituencies and the things that were important to them. And we just came up, Trivers came up with a, just a fantastic design for the building. BSI constructors, the general contractor, assembled a team of skilled artisans and craftsmen to meet the requirements of this demanding renovation. In a good renovation, uh, particularly on a project of the stature of a National Historic Landmark, it's important that that work be done in a way that makes the changes as subtle as possible. In other words, the goal of a good restoration architect is to make those changes invisible, if you like. So yeah, it can look very much as though nothing's happened uh, when you're done, except uh, what you've done is fitted into that building uh, contemporary infrastructure that will allow it to serve for another 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but if you've done it right, you've done it in a way where a person can't tell from the way it looked in 1870. And if you don't understand that, you typically do something that people will later come in and say, why would you have done that? in a building like this, and of course, that's what you want to avoid. At the same time, you're constantly confronted with this need to make it a useful participant in today's society. We were very fortunate with the tenants who chose to come to the old post office 
because their needs and the original construction meshed beautifully. An example would be at Webster University in their space one level below grade. When we originally looked at it, it was a series of little cut up rooms that had columns in the middle of some of the offices and really chopped up space. And what Trivers Associates did was absolutely fabulous. They exposed these columns, which it's almost like it was designed for it originally with these corridors flanked by these columns that go up and down the Webster space with classrooms on each side. It gives you this feel of this wonderful university and it's just a, it's a great institutional setting. Andy's firm did an amazing job of grasping with the, all these details because simply saying you'll preserve the grill work requires you to inventory every piece of grill work in the whole building which takes hundreds of hours. So the resolution of that one issue translates the hundreds of hours of Andy's time to get it right draw it up precisely so a contractor can price it precisely. And multiply that times 130 plus or minus issues, and it's a lot of work. At one point, I think we weighed the plans and specifications, just to, and it was like 60 pounds of plans and specifications. Both Trivers Architects and the BSI team worked tirelessly to make the new additions blend seamlessly with the historic features of the building. In order to make a more user and pedestrian friendly approach to the building, we opened the original historic doors and created a glass entrance, which not only allowed light into the lobby, but also invited people to come into the building. To draw people into the building, the concrete sidewalks were replaced with granite at each entrance. The parking spaces and the benches along the street were replaced with irrigated flower and tree planters. After the exterior was cleaned and repaired, the sheltered areas of the upper floors were wrapped in a nearly invisible bird netting to deter pigeons from nesting in the facade's many nooks and crannies. A new moat rail fashioned after the 1884 original was installed all around the building and even the city street lamps were replaced with historically accurate reproductions to improve the old post office's appearance by day and night. We wanted the lighting to be appropriate for this National Historic Landmark, especially since there had been no exterior building lighting in the entire history of the old post office. We wanted full bright lighting early in the evening in the winter time when it's dark at five o'clock, full lighting so that it's comfortable for students coming in and out of the building and for residents walking in the area. And then later on at night, it can be scaled back so that the lighting is very subtle and elegant. This 19th century monument was now a symbol to a new generation of the commitment, dedication, and determination of the St. Louis community. On March 15, 2006, 122 years to the day after General Sherman delivered his praise for the building during the original dedication ceremony, the people of St. Louis, elected officials, civic leaders, representatives from all the agencies and institutions involved in the renovation effort, and the DESCO DFC team celebrated the building's rededication. Mark and I are pleased to announce that we are 100% leased in this building. <laughs> Joining the state, we have <clears throat> wonderful compatible tenants led by Webster University, the Business Journal, Focus St. Louis, the Pasta House, Teach for America, and a catering kitchen, which is open for business service by Tony's, Brian Young, and the Pasta House. So, please come back. I think the, the energy and vitality that a student base bring to a community period, but to downtown in particular, will be fabulous. Having people having people and activity in this core area that will spill off into the other buildings is, in my mind, the biggest benefit. When we first started meeting with students, they said, nobody will go down there. And our faculty said, nobody will go down there. 
Well, we've had almost two turnovers of student bodies since that, that started seven years ago. And now, because not only have we talked about it so much, but the entire community is talking about it and about the revitalization of downtown, and they can't wait to get down there. Students are actually asking if we're going to have dormitories downtown to support the old post office effort. They're very excited about the potential of having dormitories and expanding the university's role downtown beyond the old post office, and this came from the students. So what started as skepticism changed until it's now totally embraced and everyone's on board. It's also true, our court has profited greatly. When we were in the annex to the Wainwright building, we had very few public visitors. A lot of our arguments were not well attended. When we sat for the first time in January of 2006 in that courtroom, it was the first time there had been court in there for 75 years. And we went in and had court there that day. We sat in bank and we had all of our judges sitting up there at that bench be uh, at the same time on one case. The courtroom was full of people who were there to celebrate us uh, reopening and having our very first case there. Welcome to this, the first session of the Missouri Court of Appeals in the old post office. And when we walked out and took that bench, you could just see it on everyone's face. Almost a look of, can you believe how cool this is? and we have tours of out-of-town visitors, historic building fans that are coming through all the time. And it's great for our court to have that exposure to the public. We like being engaged with the public we serve. The next chapter of this historic building is now being written. The neighborhood is brimming with life and vitality. With the old post office, you, you can see it's, it's almost kind of like the whirlwind of activities because on the four blocks around it, there's a lot of street activity going on, more restaurants, uh, more people living in downtown St. Louis. And I think without, you know, having the heart of the city um, alive, it's been resuscitated and, and rebuilt that the heart of the city, the old post office square, will now revitalize and keep healthy all of downtown. Over $400 million worth of redevelopment projects surrounding the old post office have been completed or are underway. You know, I'm an urban planner as well as a preservationist, and I can tell you I've never seen impact so immediate uh, and so large in scope from one building ever before in my career. This has been uh, quite a case study for us to track. We know from our own due diligence that Ten other properties were renovated largely because of the knowledge that this building was going forward and, and most of them were renovated to historic standards using the historic tax credits so there couldn't have been a better result. The beginning of the 21st century will be recorded as a time when St. Louis worked as a community to preserve, restore and position for the future this irreplaceable and magnificent structure that stands as an emblem of civic pride and cooperation. I think it means much, much more to St. Louis than merely dollars invested or jobs created. We're talking about creating a self-sustaining cycle of investment and a breathing of new life into downtown St. Louis. We truly have the makings of an opportunity to be one of the thriving cities in this global economy of the 21st century. This was um, an area of downtown. It was the most economically depressed area of downtown. And by renovating this old post office, we knew that it would provide a, be an anchor and a catalyst to the redevelopment of the older buildings around it. And we've seen that that is now happening. And now we see that there's new life breathed in an area that was such a historic part and an important part of the city and its, and its uh, development in the past. We uh, are so pleased to see that now it's going to be an important part of our history uh, and, in our, and of our future.
Thank you.